dear friends urologists uh, pure urology as you know uh, was started during the corona period when everybody was uh, not working and uh, they are working at uh, they are uh, relaxing at the home especially it was beneficial to the uh, pgs after that we continued because the discussions were going on this is actually a facebook platform initially i requested dr sabnis sir 3 years back on the same day so uh, with his uh, uh, blessings uh, even though we are not doing regularly same uh, this uh, online webinars lot of discussions are happening and a lot of people have joined so they are sharing their techniques complications and the discussion is going on that way it is helpful at the same time we have decreased the number because so many conferences are happening we have decreased the number of the uh, online sessions uh, however today uh, again an important day because we are celebrating third anniversary i once again uh, thank dr sabni sir the chairman head of the department of urology mph nadia india to accept honestly uh, in 2007 to 2010 after 3 years of my mch i used to go to nadia and uh, started uh, learning uh, uh, rirs after that uh, i did lot of conferences sir came and demonstrated subsequently i acquired some skill and then sir has given chance uh, to operate in uh, mph nadia also along with oliver traxer sir that actually encouraged me to pursue my interest in rirs which has gone to the rirs in infants and children so uh definitely he uh, guided my career a lot in the initial phases and of course now also with this uh, introduction i will share the screen uh and i will you know okay so i'll go to zoom i will play a small video on this occasion of 1 uh, and 1/2 minute uh, after that we will go to the important talk today so today uh, this is pure urology fb forum this is the video so thank you once again for this so today talk is uh, pcl in anomalous kidney uh, by dr ravindra sabni sir ravindra sabni sir is uh, as i mentioned chairman head of the department of urology mph nadia india many of the indian uh, urologists know him and many of the asian urologists also know him he is past president of urology society of india past position held in urological societies are treasurer mumbai urology society council member west zone urology society council member urological society of india honorary secretary west zone usa president west zone usa council member board of education usa chairman board of education usa honorary secretary urology society of india doing secretary for at all levels is the most important commitment to the society we all know about it he is reviewer for uh, journal of urology journal of endo urology british journal of urology world journal of urology indian journal of urology and journal of andrology he has written book written is urology instruments comprehensive guide more than 200 presentations in various journal national international conference 
more than 50 guest lectures, orations in various journal and national conferences, faculty at various state, journal, national, international conferences, demonstrative surgeries in various live operative workshops at state, journal, national conferences, operative faculty at various conferences, workshops abroad, like Qatar, Dhaka, Manila, and uh, Manila and Nepal. With this introduction, today's topic is interesting. Uh, many times, uh, uh, PCN in anomalous kidneys, uh, previously open surgery used to be there. Now, uh, PCNL is a technically demanding bival because bowel may come into the line and RIRS now has come. ESWL was also there with different mechanisms. Now, let us listen from the senior who is experienced in this field. Over to you, Sabni, sir. Thank you once again. Well, thank you, Chandra Mohan. It was, uh, uh, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. And um, I must congratulate you for uh, not only making this group, but ensuring that the enthusiasm persists. I have seen many times that so many things people start, but eventually the interest goes down, maybe six months, maybe one year, maybe two years. And we have seen so many groups forming and then disappearing. But you have continued the interest, and that's a great service to the society, to the PG students, and also to the consultants, and not only the uh, Indian urology, but across the globe, because your follower of this particular Facebook page is more than 10,000, which itself speaks the volume, and it itself shows that the uh, the people who are following and people who are interested in watching these events, watching this discussion, reading and commenting upon it is not only restricted to India, but across the globe. And that's a very uh, great achievement. So thank you very much thank you, for sir. inviting me for this uh, particular uh, webinar. And uh, I remember that during COVID, the first idea was floated by you. And then um, eventually, uh, by my great luck, I was the first speaker for mm -hmm. giving a talk. On the three anniversaries, you are the speaker, sir. Yeah, so every year, every year I've been uh, taking a webinar and today is the third uh, anniversary. And I have a really great pleasure in um, uh, giving a talk on this particular uh, topic. So today I'm going to talk about the PCNL in anomalous kidneys. Why PCNL in anomalous kidneys is uh, so much of an interest? As you know, that PCNL itself is a lot of uh, interesting. Uh, there are a lot of interesting aspects about PCNL. There are some people who promote PCNL like anything. There are some, there are some people who criticize PCNL uh, like anything. And if you see the, uh, the advances which are taking place right from the uh, time when PCNL was invented in 1980s, till uh, now in 2022 or 24. There are so many advances which have taken place. And if you see one particular thing about PCNL, so I'm not talking of anomalous, but the PCNL as such, there are so many things which have taken place. And therefore the PCNL is guided by stone-free rate, the treatment efficiency, what uh, it can achieve, whatever is the size of the stone, the relatively less morbidity as compared to many other things, and therefore, these are the aspects which are very, very attractive. And that's why the PCNL is uh, to be done or is to be done uh, wherever it is possible. When we talk of PCNL in any kidney, there are many advantages. And then subsequently, we'll come to the uh, anomalous part of it, anomalous kidney about it. But the biggest advantage as compared to any other treatment, whether it is RIRS, whether it is ESWL, whether it is combined, is that the visualization, uh, the visualized stone can always be removed. Unlike uh, ESWL, unlike even RIRS, sometimes you see the stone, but the angle is so awkward that you can just see the stone, but you can't do anything. Neither you can relocate, neither you can uh, fragment in situ. And that happens. But generally in PCNL, if you see the stone, uh, it can always be removed. The collecting system can be inspected directly. So there is no problem at all. Each and every calyx can be inspected. Small stones can be identified and removed. If you, see, if you see on fluoroscopy or if you see under vision or if you see through endoscopy a small stone, that can always be removed. There are various methods of removing, whether it is with flexible nephroscopy, whether it is additional track or whatever, but it can always be removed. Important thing is that track can be kept open indefinitely 
and therefore repeated inspections are possible. Unlike RIRS, unlike this, if you keep the nephrostomy, the tract remains and therefore maybe two days, maybe three days. If you want to go once, twice, thrice, you can always do multiple stage and the tract can be utilized and the complete clearance can be achieved. So that's the biggest uh, benefit of PCNL. Important thing as compared to what meta methodologists that we have today is the success or lack of success is readily apparent. It is not like RIRS or it is not like ESWL, it is not like any other method that you do your job and then you uh, rely on time that, okay, the fragments will eventually come out. The success or the clearance is not achieved on the table, on the spot or on the day one, but success is achieved later on. And therefore, the biggest benefit of PCNL is that whether you are successful or whether you are not, it is apparent on the spot. So that's a very important thing. Use of flexible nephroscope with laser has reduced the number of uh, access and that's very important in an anomalous kidney. That with the introduction of flexible nephroscope, you can actually go into different, different calyces, put up a dormia and bring the stone into the main tract or you put a laser and fragment them in situ and therefore the, the criticism that PCNL involves the multiple tracts, especially if there is a stone in the parallel calyx, also has gone down. So these are basically a lot of advantages of PCNL as such. Now let us see uh, about the uh, anomalous kidney. So in anomalous kidney, when we talk of uh, the uh, stone management, it can be ESWL. For, for example, any stone management in urinary tract, it can be ESWL, RIRS, MIP, MIP and PCNL. It is very uh, funny that when the PCNL was invented, it was thought that this is the uh, minimal invasive uh, treatment. And that was the biggest change from open surgery. When our residency, we were uh, residents, that time we were doing all stone surgeries by, by open surgery. It is pyelolithotomy, nephrolithotomy, anatrophic nephrolithotomy, multiple radial nephrotomy, so many things which we were doing. But when the PCNL came in, it was a it was an important milestone. It was a radical change, and it was considered that it's a minimally invasive treatment as a PCNL. Well, over a period of four or five decades now down the line, the PCNL which we were doing at that time is now considered as invasive PCNL, and therefore there is something called as minimally invasive PCNL has come in, and we will talk something about it. And people know that now mini perk. Ultra mini perk, super mini perk, micro mini perk, micro perk. There are so many other modalities have come in which actually are considered as less invasive and therefore these are called as minimal invasive PCNL and then PCNL has become a standard PCNL. So even in anomalous kidney when we talk of stone management, it will revolve around these three or four factors or modalities. Why anomalous kidney is so important and it is uh, important from the discussion point of view. As we all know that in a developmental stage uh, in the intrauterine life, the kidneys are placed actually much lower down in the pelvis. And as the fetus grows, the kidney ascend up and then actually move to the original position or, or the normal position what we see in the uh, adult life. So if there is an anomaly which takes place anywhere in the ascent rotation of this uh, kidney, it will result into anomalous kidney, anomalous position of the kidney. So what those anomalies can be? So this is a normal kidney, normally ascended kidney. Sometimes the kidney doesn't ascend and therefore that remains into the uh, pelvis. So that is called as pelvic kidney. Sometimes the ascent is not complete. It is halfway through. So that is called as uh, lumbar kidney. So that is situated somewhere um, in the, um, uh, just above the SI joint. Sometimes as kidney ascends, the in a, in a intrauterine life in a fetus, the kidney actually is facing, the pelvis is facing anteriorly. And as it ascends, it undergoes little rotation. And therefore the pelvis then faces medially, pelvis comes medially. If the pelvic kidney remains like that, it doesn't get ascended, obviously it does not get rotated also. And therefore you will see that majority of the uh, pelvic kidneys, 
they are the pelvis is facing anteriorly and the calyces are bang posterior so that is one important anatomical landmark or the development a thing which we have to see that as kidney ascends it undergoes rotation so incompletely ascended kidney will always have a little bit of a rotational anomalies sometimes they ascend completely but does not undergo rotation so these are all mal rotated kidneys sometimes the lower pole of the kidney gets fused and therefore when it gets ascended it is stuck by the inferior mesenteric artery because this is in midline the inferior mesenteric artery arises from the aorta in the midline and therefore this will not allow it to uh, go up and therefore when there is a fusion anomalies they are usually not completely ascended because the inferior mes mesenteric artery prevents the complete ascent of the kidney and therefore you will realize that the horseshoe kidneys are little bit low lying so that's a important uh, factor we consider and when we talk of a pcnl or any treatment modality in the horseshoe kidney this particular factor which is a developmental factor has to be considered because it will help in understanding the anatomy and that is how can plan the treatment accordingly so if, what is the anomalous kidney anomalous kidneys can be horseshoe kidney which is a very very common anomaly which we see in uh, anomalous kidneys next common is the ectopic kidney which can be pelvic ectopic it can be lumbar ectopic next anomaly can be mal rotated kidneys or it can be cross ectopia as you know that kidney ascends but sometimes it deviates in, into its path and goes on the other side so that is called as cross ectopia sometimes it not only goes into the other side but it gets fused with the other side kidney so that is called as cross fused ectopia so these are all various anomalies which can be present and as like any other uh, stone can form in any other kidney uh, the stones can form into anomalous kidney also and because it is structurally and position wise it is abnormal the any treatment modality whichever modality you consider it will always have a little bit of a bearing and and little different as compared to what we would do a pcnl or rirs or eswl in the normally placed kidney so what are those things we will consider today so in a horseshoe kidney uh, eswl what are the problems of eswl problem of eswl in anomalous kidney uh, in a horseshoe kidney is that localization becomes difficult because as you know the axis is different the uh, the ascent is incomplete the position is different calyces are oriented completely differently and therefore like how we uh, uh, locate uh, the stone either with the fluoroscopy or with the ultrasound it becomes difficult in a horseshoe kidney because sometimes the the stone lies on the spine and it is not easily uh, localizable sometimes in a if you really have to give uh, eswl uh sometimes you have to give prone position sometimes you can manage in the supine or in the oblique position but sometimes you have to give prone position especially if the stone is placed in the uh, in the pelvis then you may have to give this because if you localize from the from behind from the back then the spine or some other bony structures may come in and then that may not allow the uh, the shock waves to reach the stone and therefore you may have to give prone position and do it drainage may be poor hence clearance may be affected because there is a long isthmus thick isthmus which is present and therefore the uh, drainage is always hampered therefore it is very important that whichever modality you do uh, you have to break the stone completely and in a pcnl advantage is that you can remove all those fragments and not depend on the nature to uh, cure it or to clear it because there is always little bit of a difficulty in the drainage of a horseshoe kidneys and therefore with the eswl there are many papers which say that success rate varies between 50 to 74% which is not acceptable and therefore uh, eswl is little bit on the lower side when it comes to horseshoe uh, kidney uh, stone treatment what are the problems in rirs technically it is challenging especially if the if the stone is in the lower calyx because it has to travel uh, the uh, ureteroscope has to go over the isthmus deep into the pelvis go behind posteriorly 
and then there is again an angulation of the calyces and if the stones are uh, extending into the isthmus the angle becomes extremely extremely awkward and therefore technically it becomes really very challenging uh, in rirs there are some calyceal stones especially if the calyces are extending into the isthmus may not be approachable at all by rirs pre uh, operation Pre-operative stenting we are requires in many cases so that subsequently the stage becomes easier. So these are all problems of RIRS and therefore the choice of treatment remains PCNL. Before we discuss about the uh, horseshoe kidney PCNL, we have to understand that this, there are some facts which we have to really understand. Now what are those important facts? They are either anatomical or functional facts. Uh, it is the commonest congenital renal anomaly that we have already discussed. Kidney is much lower than the normal. And what is the what is the importance of this? Because puncture puncture is much lower than the normal. Quite often we see that in a normally positioned kidney, you have to go supracostal, the uh, half of the kidney is above the twelfth rib. In uh, in a horseshoe kidney, you will never find like that. Even if you have to uh, puncture the upper calyx, it is usually below this uh, below the uh, rib, and therefore supracostal puncture is never required in horseshoe kidney. So puncture is much lower because kidney is much lower. Upper calyx is the preferred calyx. Why? Because as you know that this is a rotational anomalies. The uh, lower calyces are angulated and it gets fused with the isthmus, and therefore. The posterior and lateral directed uh, calyces are the upper calyceal group and therefore the preferred puncture is always from the upper calyx and the benefit is that from upper calyx you can approach the PUJ, you can approach the lower calyx and you can approach the isthmus also. So upper calyx uh, puncture is always preferred. Lower calyx is difficult to access because Kidney access is not the access what we get in the normally normally placed kidney. It is exactly opposite. And therefore, the lower calyx actually goes too much of medial side. And therefore, puncturing the lower calyx becomes very difficult. Pelvis facing anterior and calyces facing posterior. So that so is another question, time. sir. Here, one yes. small question. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Go from the upper calyx. Uh, most of the times you can reach the pelvis, which is dependent. But yes. isthmic, isthmic region, uh, we feel that uh, turning again, isthmic region will be more uh, more uh, anterior. Correct. So, so isthmus, when, they, when there is a isthmus, even though upper calyx and pelvis, they are in a straight line, the isthmus, as you go towards isthmus, there is one more angulation which comes in. Yes. And when you use the rigid scope, that angle becomes very difficult. And if you go excessive torque, then the bleeding starts. Yes, so that yes. is a very important factor. And therefore, in a situation like this, you have to use the flexible nephroscope. If there is a stone in the uh, isthmus, you will you will see that uh, the isthmus is a little bit dilated because of the stone. And then uh, you go with the flexible nephroscope into the isthmus. You can manage the angle and then visualize and then bring back that stone into the uh, renal pelvis and then treat it. Or if it is not possible to um, uh, relocate that stone, then you have to fragment it into the uh, isthmus itself and then uh, take it out. The other thing is that you may take additional puncture, which is not in the uh, upper calyx, but a little lower, maybe middle uh, calyx. Thereby, you can regulate uh, the uh, stone a little more. That angle can be uh, manipulated. Yes, exactly this point I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, only for so, stomach in last stage, you can reach re rechange the puncture direction also. Correct, correct, correct. Right, correct. thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. The other anatomical factor is that pelvis is facing anteriorly and calyces posteriorly. So when we take uh, the normal uh, placed kidney, our uh, punctures are in the posterior axillary line. These are all lateral punctures, so that we go directly into the periphery of the calyx. We don't go to the infundibulum and this. But here, the calyces are facing posteriorly and therefore your puncture is much more medial. So as compared to the normally placed kidney, it is not in the posterior axillary line, but it is towards the midline, maybe halfway between the spine midline, uh, midline and the, uh, the posterior axillary line. So this is what is the difference between the uh, 
puncture at uh, puncture uh, when you are making the access to the uh, kidney these are anatomical facts the other important facts are that vessels come from anterior quite often uh, people are afraid are anomalous kidney horseshoe kidney they will be abnormal vessel there will be increased bleeding oh let us not do it and is that but that is nothing to worry about it all the vessels they always come from anterior and therefore when you make the tract from posterior there is no additional risk simply because of the horseshoe shaped kidney and it is safe to puncture from the posterior side pelvis is elongated and the lower calyx goes into the isthmus this is anatomical fact approach to lower calyx and isthmus as you were asking is very difficult because there is an additional angle from the pelvis going into the isthmus so you may need flexible nephroscope for reaching into that angle and the other important thing in a adult is that quite often you need a long scope when you make the uh, the puncture from the upper calyx and if you want to approach the lower calyx or even the upper ureter or puj quite often you will see that all your amplats has completely gone inside and still you are not able to reach and that is because the tract size or the tract length is much more in a horseshoe kidney and therefore there are specially designed long amplats and long nephroscopes are available which are very very useful in the horseshoe kidney other other thing where the long amplats and the long uh, nephroscope or sheath uh, is required is in the supine pcnl like horseshoe kidney the supine pcnl also in a normal uh, place kidney supine pcnl uh, requires a longer tract and therefore there are specially designed sheaths which are available which are meant for supine pcnl similarly there are specially designed nephroscopes and the amplats or the sheaths now mini perk uh, sheaths which are available which are longer in length than the usual which are very handy and very useful some other facts of horseshoe kidney pcnl when we are considering is that puj has a high insertion and hence drainage may be hampered as we saw uh, some time back and therefore it is necessary to have complete clearance sometimes 4 mm 5 mm stone we tend to uh, forget about it and say that okay this will clear up there is no problem but that sort of a thing is not acceptable in a horseshoe kidney because the drainage is uh, not that efficient and therefore complete clearance not leaving any smaller fragments is very very important every case does not need puj correction sometimes you will find that even in the post operative period or even in the pre operative uh, images you will see that pelvis is dilated and in the late phase a little bit, a little bit of a hampered drainage but that's a normal thing so that doesn't mean that every case requires a puj correction that's not right you have to uh, you have to uh, treat the stones and uh, keep the puj under observation uh, when it is not clearly a puj obstruction incidence of urolithiasis is more than the normal kidney simply because sometimes there is more stasis the abnormally placed calyces and therefore if you see head to head comparison um the horseshoe kidney may have little bit more chances of uh, stone formation now let me show some of the videos how to tackle the uh, horseshoe kidney pcnl this is a 7 year old boy uh, febrile uti and was found to have bilateral stones and uh, ibp was done it was detected to have bilateral renal, renal stone creatine everything was uh, normal and this was the right kidney this was the left kidney and this was the uh, ct iv this was a conventional plate this was a reconstructed image and you will see that this is the horseshoe kidney you see the abnormal position of the kidney this is a cut the anteriorly it is all fused on the spine it is uh, showing that these are the uh, this and that is how you do it it is in a prone position so you do ct urography in all patients sir ct urography when it is indicated not not in every case but generally generally anomalous kidney when we see the especially horseshoe kidney ectopic kidney our protocol is to do ct ivp yeah but if you are planning to uh, if the kidney is uh, good say for example the unascended kidney or lumbar kidney it is good parenchyma simple stone you are planning for ris and is that don't have to do it but okay. if you are planning for pcnl from our point of view uh ct ivp is necessary because you get idea how exactly is the calyces orientation yes sir so this is a ultrasound guided puncture you can see that uh, stone this is a pelvis this is uh, 
upside down. So this is actually upper calyx uh, puncture. And most of the times you use ultrasound, sir? Uh, yeah, most of the things are ultrasound. Anomalous kidney, it is very useful to do ultrasound guided because uh, not that much in the uh, horseshoe, but in other kidneys, it is uh, useful uh, with the ultrasound so that you avoid any damage. So this is upper calyx uh, puncture. Uh, put the flow uh, contrast to visualize the, the, the system. Ultrasound, is there any special technique or it is same? No, like for, if, for, for horseshoe, there is no problem. Because as such, you are going from the posterior side only. So there yes. is no there is no fear of damaging any surrounding structures. Yeah. yeah. But if it is a, a pelvic ectopic at least, if you are if you don't have ultrasound, you just cannot venture it. Cannot cannot very venture. difficult. So this is how uh, you can uh, do. Then uh, uh, this is uh, uh, dilatation with the uh, screw dilatation, uh, single step uh, screw dilatation, upper calyx uh, puncture. And then you see the stone and start breaking the uh, stone. Uh, once you make the tract and once you this, then it is like any other uh, kidney. There is no problem. Make sure that either you use shock pulse previously. Uh, sorry. Previously, it was uh, ultrasonic energy. Then came the lithoclast. Then um, uh, came triology. Then came shock pulse. There are so many other energy sources came in. Idea is that whichever uh, methodology you do it, it should be completely cleared. That is very, very important. Important part in horseshoe kidney, uh, other than any uh, normally placed kidney, is the flexible nephroscope. So flexible nephroscope becomes very handy. And in fact, I have seen there are some centers, especially uh, when the American people, they came in, they say that in a horseshoe kidney, it is uh, very important that you put a flexible nephroscope at the end inspect all calices, ensure that everything is cleared up, and then uh, exit the system. So horseshoe kidney... One, one question, sir. Flexible, yes. flexible nephroscopy using the laser is difficult. I mean, that is my experience. What is the, any, for example, stone we cannot basket a small area. If you wanted to do keeping in that position and doing... Uh, not as easy as RIRS, sir. What I mean to no, that is not as easy as RIRS because the the in RIRS the scope size is only uh, seven point five, and therefore the channel size is small. The laser doesn't dangle in the yes. in the in the in the in the channel, whereas here the channel size is quite big. Yeah, and therefore the laser gets dangled up, and that is a problem. Yes, sir. And therefore, uh, I, I completely agree with you that putting a laser and breaking is not is very difficult. And therefore, what we do is that if the relocation is not possible, we just go up to the stone and with the laser, with few fragments, we don't try to break the stone completely. Yes, we sir. just fragment it, make sure that the impaction goes away and the basket uh, can be put in and it can be engaged in the basket. And then yes, subsequently sir. you relocate. Because yeah. to break the stone completely with flexible becomes very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, pointing out the laser uh, fiber exactly focusing on the stone becomes very difficult. And that's uh, that's a difficulty. Either you can use the bigger uh, laser fiber, but then your angulation uh, gets uh, reduced. Or, or uh, for less dangling, we can put a uh, ureteric uh, catheter and through that you can put a laser fiber. But all this uh, provided, the angle is allowing you to do that. Yeah. To reduce the dangling into the channel. So when you put a flexible nephroscope through the amplats, you can actually go right up to the, um, this is the system, this is going into the isthmus. And flexible nephroscope, you can go right up to the isthmus, check this calyx, this, this calyx. Otherwise, when you put a rigid nephroscope, you can only go up to the PUJ here. It is not possible to angulate this way because then you have to go, go completely give a traction here and can cause bleeding. In that case, the, as I said in the beginning, sometimes you have to make the puncture in this calyx where the angle can be manipulated and a small nephroscope can be inserted. But the flexible nephroscopy is a very useful tool in a horseshoe kidney. So in a horseshoe kidney nutshell, uh, the understanding the anatomy uh, is a uh, uh, key factor and it leads to the uh, success, higher success rate. And more than 1.5 centimeter PCNL is very effective. As actually is thought of, in a horseshoe kidney, PCNL is actually easier 
than the normally placed kidney because your puncture is bang on the posterior side. And once you make a proper puncture, uh, it becomes uh, quite easy provided the stones are uh, located in the pelvis and in the accessible calyx. The next anomaly what we see is the ectopic kidney. Ectopic kidney anomaly is very rare. Uh, the incidence is uh, 1 in 3000 uh, live births. It could be pelvic ectopic which lies in the pelvis not ascended fully. It lies in the pelvic retroperitoneum anterior to the sacrum and inferior to the bifurcation of the aorta. And uh, pel uh, the pelvis faces anteriorly or medially depending on the rotation and blood supply always comes from the iliac or the uh, lower aorta. So these are the anatomical facts about the uh, ectopic kidney. So what are the problems of uh, ectopic kidney? The problem, whichever method you do, or especially if it is a, a PCNL, the kidney is surrounded by bowel. So that is a problem. Whichever methodology you adopt, even if you uh, put a uh, ESWL or this that, it is all surrounded by bowel and so many other things. It is situated in the retroperitoneal on the medial side. So, so it is very difficult to localize. Sometimes in a normal x-ray or normal fluoroscopy, you don't even see the stone because it is lying on the spine and sometimes it's very difficult to locate where exactly the stone is. Posteriorly lying on the bone, sometimes the whole kidney is lying on the bone and there is no way you can uh, localize the stone by ESWL or take the puncture uh, from the posterior side, uh, from behind, from the back, because everything is uh, lying on the bone. Pelvis and calyces facing anterior and therefore, if you make an anterior puncture, it is not a proper thing because you will be directly going into the pelvis, which is uh, not acceptable at all. And therefore, pelvis lying medially, uh, anterior and medially is uh, another problem. Abnormal and inconsistent vasculature, depending on the how much is the ascent of the kidney. If it is very much low, it, the, the vessels will come from the iliac. If they, are, if they are a little bit higher up, it will come from the lower uh, aorta or common iliac. And that is very important, uh, especially when you are planning the other modalities of treatment like uh, lab-guided or uh, ectopic uh, or the uh, laparoscopic pyelolithotomy or robotic or something like that. Sir, ESWL days 30 years back, uh, do you have experienced anything different to your uh, a comment? ESWL on, in the pelvic kidney. Yeah, pelvic kidney. No, pelvic kidney previously we used to do because that time there was no option. There was no RIRS. And uh, other option was only open surgery. That time laparoscopy also was not that much. And therefore, sometimes we used to do uh, uh, this uh, uh, ESWL, but always in a prone position. You put a ureteric catheter, give a little bit of a fluid, then uh, give prone position. And from behind, from the anterior thing, you give uh, shocks. But those are all uh, anecdotal cases where the results were not up to the mark. And therefore, when we when we have to do PCNL, uh, either it has to be ultrasound guided or it has to be laparoscopy guided. So when we talk of a ultrasound guided PCNL, what do we what what do we uh, mean by ultrasound guided PCNL? PC, uh, see, this is the bladder. These are all intestines which are surrounding. And when you press, generally when you get an ectopic kidney, you will feel on palpation that there is a bulge. Kidney, you will always feel. And when there is a bulge, it bulges from the, uh, on the anterior abdominal wall. So if you press with the ultrasound probe on the kidney, what will happen is that the bowel will get displaced because you are pressing the abdominal wall on the kidney. Kidney structure is fixed. Even though it is abdo uh, pelvic ectopic kidney, it is in the retroperitoneum. It is not uh, inside the abdo intraperitoneal. It is a retroperitoneal structure. So when you press with the ultrasound probe, the bowels will get displaced and that is how uh, you see on ultrasound if there is anything in between the skin surface and the kidney surface and if there is nothing, you can puncture it. So technically, this puncture will be trans-abdominal, trans-peritoneal, but not through the bowel. So you understand that the puncture is uh, cannot be uh, uh, without uh, injuring or without going through the peritoneum. It will have to go through peritoneum. 
but you have to ensure that you, you are not going through the bavel and that yes. is what the, that is how you would take the measures lab guided of course it is uh, uh, it is described and many people do it we also have done a few cases laparoscopy is introduced through umbilicus <clears throat> then you make a puncture you make a puncture by seeing the fluoroscopy and at the same time see very tricky that when you uh, do laparoscopy what you have to do is not that you create a pneumoperitoneum and then you make a puncture that is not possible because your needle will not reach pneumoperitoneum is there so you identify from the surface marking where exactly the uh, kidney is whether there are bowels present or not if the kidney surface is covered by the bowel you have to dissect and reflect the bowel and ensure that the uh, the uh, convex border of the kidney is exposed now once you do that then uh, deflate the pneumoperitoneum and with the uh, uh, with the uh, ultrasound guide or with the fluoroscopy guide you make a puncture now again uh, you see whether you have punctured through laparoscope or not so you have to create little pneumoperitoneum and see whether you have injured any bowel or you have injured anything any other important structure or not if you are not injured if it is the puncture is proper then it is perfectly all right or else you have to manipulate the needle with the laparoscopy guide in such a way that uh, it uh, creates a puncture so it is very difficult it is it requires a lot of learning curve we have done very anecdotal cases and our uh, preference is always laparoscopy guided once you uh, uh, once you ensure that the uh, the puncture is proper there is no bowel injury there is no colonic problem everything is proper then you don't have to you have to just keep the laparoscope in position deflate the whole abdomen and treat like any other uh, tract dilatation everything is like any other case once you finish the stone uh, thing then after putting nephrostomy uh, once you put nephrostomy again you have to inflate and see uh how much is the blood which has uh, spilled into the peritoneal cavity if there is too much of a spillage you uh, 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 suck out uh, through the uh, peritoneum reconfirm that everything is proper keep a drain in the, into the peritoneum additional apart from the nephrostomy and then uh, close the abdomen so that is how it is done as a lab guided now i will show you important uh, steps of the ultrasound guided so this is the stone which appeared like a like a bladder stone but this was a ectopic kidney uh, stone and this is what is the upper calyx uh, lower calyx and that's a ureter going like so this is uh, this is the ectopic kidney pelvic uh, ectopic kidney now this is important how position we give see i will show you again that this is what is the position so this position is very important what we do is that we keep a bolster here under the buttocks and little bit towards the midline so it becomes oblique so oblique position itself makes the bowel fall on the uh, away from the uh, puncture uh, site and once you once those bowels are falling and then we give a pressure with the ultrasound this is a old machine very old video with the patient you ensure that now you see here that this is a kidney this is a surface and there is hardly anything between the kidney surface and the, uh, the skin surface so it is safe to have that puncture so then you make a puncture then you see that needle, needle is going properly inside it is into the uh, the calyx and uh, once you make uh, the uh, the puncture you get uh, the fluid important thing here is that the guide wire has to be parked excessively because sometimes if guide wire slips then it will be a complete failure because if the fluid leakage happens the sonographic landmarks becomes blur and then it becomes very difficult always ensure that you are in the uh, proper uh, position all the stones and all the dilators are reaching properly and once you make the proper entry then the field is clear then there is no problem then it is like any other uh, case of uh, pcnl uh no problem at all at the end it is always good idea in a ectopic kidney as a protocol we always uh, put nephrostomy we always put double gestant uh, because that's an additional safety we have to take because 
even if you take out nephrostomy, some spillage can occur and that can cause palatic ileus. It can go into the abdomen because it is a transperitoneal and therefore digestant is required, nephrostomy is required. It is not uh, proper to do um, the uh, tubeless PCNL in ectopic. So this is how you do it. Again, at the end, check with the uh, sound that everything is fine. And then uh, the, do, so this is a post-operative x-ray. Everything is clear. So that is how ectopic kidney PCNL is done. This is a 40 years old male, solitary kidney. Now you see that this, these are some of the tricky issues. Solitary kidney uh, PCNL, ectopic kidney. CT scan shows uh, the upper ureteric. This is the upper ureteric stone. This is a dilated kidney, single kidney, both fossas are empty, absent kidney. This is a showing uh, CT, this is a coronal view, sagittal view. So this was done in a two stage. In a first stage, we just created ureteric catheter put and uh, track was made, ultrasound guided puncture in a supine oblique position. And we realized that we could go, but uh, the angulation from upper calyx, from this calyx to the ureter like this was very difficult. And therefore we just could, uh, could see the stone, but then angulation and complete clearance was difficult. So it was staged. So we put a nephrostomy, allow this to then, and then, uh, so this is what is the uh, uh, first stage, what we described, uh, put a ureteric catheter, ensure that uh, this, and then with ultrasound, make a puncture in the uh, appropriate calyx, whichever calyx you see here, there is nothing in between. So you are safe to go into the kidney as such, this was dilated kidney. So make a puncture. And then uh, you see the uh, little bit of a portion of a stone, but it was not uh, completely, could not be removed completely. Part of the stone can be removed and therefore it was a staged, uh, it was decided to stage the procedure. Subsequently, the stage becomes quite easy because you put a ureteric catheter, you, you put a nephrostomy, the tract gets matured. Because of ureteric catheter, the ureter also gets uh, dilated. And because of the fragments which are removed, the disimpaction goes away. And that is how uh, you can see that this is the stone which are left over. And sometimes you give push from the abdominal wall. That also makes uh, angle a uh, little easy. And this is how you put a nephrostomy, amplats, and then uh, make sure that all the stones are completely cleared up. And the, uh, this is how the stone is uh, removed completely and I put a double gesture and this is a post-operative uh, picture, uneventful recovery. This was the uh, solitary kidney. So we wanted to see how exactly what has happened to the pelvis and other things because it was an impacted stone. So there's a follow-up CTIVP which shows that there's a normal creatinine, good drainage, no, no obstruction across the PUJ. This is another case. Pelvic but one small question by the audience that uh, in, yeah. when you are using the intra... Uh, operatively laparoscopic assistance. Uh -huh. If you raise the pressure abdomen, it will go much higher and needle will feel sharp for fall, fall short. Fall short. So he is asking because she's asking that uh, generally is, will you keep the pressure low or puncture first in the without distance? So, so, so two things. Uh, first yeah. you puncture, you assess. If you see that kidney is properly exposed, you know where exactly it is. Yeah. Then uh, deflate the whole abdomen and make yes, a puncture. Sir. Technically, even if needle goes through bowel, it does not matter. So that is a benefit. So once you put a puncture, you get a fluid, then you uh, inflate the abdomen, check whether it is uh, injured anything or not, and then you yeah. proceed. Okay. Suppose sometimes what happens is that even multiple attempts, you are not able to puncture it, your fluid doesn't come in. Then what you have to do is that through the laparoscope, you see and inflate a little bit and take a long needle and under vision, try to go uh, into the pelvic lateral system pelvic. with a little bit of a pressure, not a full distended abdomen. And there you, you need to use a long needle. Idea is to put a needle into the pelvic lateral system without uh, damaging any surrounding organ. Sometimes it goes into pelvis also, no, sir? Sometimes it is pelvis, so that is what you have to check. See, if you if directly goes into the pelvis, and you dilate, then it is a problem because then pelvis will get cicatrized, it will not uh, close down, it will keep on leaking. So yeah. you have to confirm with the laparoscopy that it is not directly uh, into the pelvis and it is uh, through the uh, through the parenchyma. Mm, okay, sir. 
all right so this is what is the horseshoe kidney and uh, this is how uh, i'm sorry this is a pelvic ectopic kidney again the same way that uh, puncture is done with the ultrasound and um, once you get the thing then you dilate the tract all this is in the supine oblique position yes. so that's very important the important thing is that the amplats or whichever sheath you want to put in has to be put and the assistant has to hold because inadvertently if your amplat uh, slips out, then uh, it will cause problem. Now, this patient had another stone which was not accessible. So, what we did is that through the same tract with the Y puncture, we did it because subsequently ultrasound becomes difficult. So, that also can be done with the with the Y puncture. You make a tract and then uh, ensure that uh, that uh, Y tract is utilized. This was a case where there was a small fragment which was not accessible. Second stage, uh, only nephrostomy was put. In stage two, the complete clearance was done. No bowel injury. Everything is fine. And the stones were completely cleared. So this is a patient where the uh, 57 years old male, you see the kidney. This is the uh, anteriorly placed uh, uh, pelvis. There is no way there is a window. You see this? Bilateral, this is the uh, uh, normally placed kidney and this is the ectopic kidney. Yes. So here uh, you see this stone, it is uh, 16 millimeter in size with the uh, uh, well 130 uh, HU. So in this case, we did micropuck. This is the micropuck system and the steps of micropuck are so this is very handy. Uh, Micropark, if you can locate the kidney and so the same way the position with ultrasound, you put a uh, uh, make a small nick because it's a micropark, so you don't need uh, to do a uh, uh, big uh, tract under ultrasound. Locate the stone so nicely it is uh, visualized. Now you see that the fluid is coming in. You confirm that uh, everything is uh, proper. Uh, there is no extra position, nothing. <coughs> and uh, uh, you see that sometimes you feel the angulation uh, with the micropark. Sometimes it is difficult to angulate, but in this case, we could actually, um, the calyx was dilated, so we could uh, put the uh, uh, micropark system inside. And with little bit of a uh, angulation, we could see the stone. See this, the angulation. Sometimes in angulation in micropark becomes difficult because the needle gets bent. But uh, this was possible here. We could see the stone. And then uh, the stone was uh, completely cleared with the laser. As uh, we described or discussed in the beginning that micropark, the problem is that you just break the stone like RIRS and uh, wait or depend on the nature to clear the stone. That is what is the disadvantage of micropark. But here, since it was angulated and this, yes, we decided to do micropark. Uretic catheter was seen properly. UJ was proper. And uh, the stone was completely uh, cleared. Uretic catheter keeps on draining. That is how it keeps the pressure low. And in micropark, there is nothing like uh, keeping a tube. So this was an ectopic kidney stone uh, completely cleared with micropark with just a puncture mark on the, on the, on the abdomen. So that is what um, uh, very gratifying uh, results. Yes, sir. So this is the cross fuse ectopia. See, there are stones in the both the system. This was a yes. big stone here. This was a stone in the pelvis. Cross fuse ectopia. This was a reconstructed image. And again, the ultrasound guided. You see that this is a big stone. Nothing in the uh, in between the surface and uh, this. And the uh, the puncture was made. The dilatation was done. And this stone was uh, completely cleared. Uh, once that was completely cleared, then that was uh, then uh, uh, the next uh, nephrostomy was kept, and the other other moiety uh, thing was punctured. Sorry, I will go back. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is uh, what is. So this is this this moiety is cleared. There is a ureteric catheter on the other side also. So that puncture was made, that system was dilated. This was a pelvic stone, staghorn type of stone. 
and the track was dilated. This is how it was uh, tackled, ureteric catheter. That ureteric catheter is of the other system. And this was, uh, uh, sometimes it goes into the uh, other thing. So what you have to do is give the little pressure from outside. So that actually brings the kidney, the, uh, the calyx into the position in the angle. And that is how you can uh, migrate it stone can be approached from the uh, from the same tract. Flexible nephroscope, there was a small stone which was basketed. This was angle. This was small stone which was basketed and it was completely uh, cleared. So that is how you see the both systems. This is the uh, same uh, time it was done this stone and this stone. So uh, it was cleared completely. This is a malnutrated kidney, angulated axis. So many stones, you see that? Yes, sir. And the axis was completely different. It was done with the uh, ultrasound uh, guided. There were additional punctures with the fluoroscopy guided. Multiple stones were removed. These are all secondary stones. There was no PUJ obstruction. But uh, the, uh, the stones were uh, uh, formed because it was uh, not a classical POJ obstruction, but it was a difficult uh, drainage. So this patient is likely to have multiple stones, but the only way is that you have to treat as and when it occurs. The important thing is that stone clearance completely, even though you need two stage, three stage, doesn't matter. But with the flexible nephroscope, with the thing, everything has to uh, get completely cleared. So with the advent of PCNL, open surgery is not required in a situation where PCNL is not possible. Sometimes you don't have the angle because they are completely covered with bowel and the whole colysis are uh, on the bone. In that case, uh, ideal would be laparoscopic or robotic pyelolithotomy because once you put the uh, laparoscopy inside, what you see, the moment you reflect the colon, what you see is the all pelvis and then it becomes quite difficult that you straight away take the incision on the on the pelvis and then uh, remove the stones uh, intact so open surgery is replaced by minimally invasive surgeries and every modality whether it is rirs whether it is ecirs whether it is lap robotic everybody every modality has a place especially when it comes to anomalous kidney uh, stones thank you very much uh, chandrabhan for giving this opportunity thank you sir Sir, uh, some of the questions, sir. We will yes, take yes. quick questions. If the radio lucent stone is there, if the ultrasound is not available, yeah. Um, uh, in uh, Arshu kidney, uh, if multiple stones are there in calyces, especially, yes. yes. My question is clear. Uh, intraoperatively, one calyx to other calyx, if you go from the upper calyx, is it easy? I want to know in the ectopic kidney. Ectopic kidney, it appears very difficult because acute angulation will be there. Yeah. So, do you have any preference in ectopic kidney where you want to puncture? Uh, same thing in horseshoe kidney. These are the two. No. So I will I will answer you. Horseshoe kidney, multiple punctures, even if you don't have ultrasound, no problem. Okay. Because in ultrasound, we are not much worried about the bowel, which is coming provided it is from the upper and the middle calyx so that you can always choose from the yeah. fluoroscopy. So you don't need uh, this. Too much of uh, medial place calyx, lower calyx, we never puncture. Even if you have to go from the to the isthmus, it will always be uh, oh, middle yeah. calyx at the most. So uh, ultrasound, strictly speaking, is not required. You can do under fluoroscopy guided. But in uh, ectopic kidney, uh, we would never do with just the fluoroscopy because you never know. On fluoroscopy, you may think that everything is fine, but uh, the bowel may get injured and therefore it is very, very difficult uh, to venture into that. Do you now, think with the nephroscope, flexible uh, nephroscope in an ectopic kidney sometimes is uh, tricky because all the calyces have, uh, we are oriented to a particular type of uh, calyceal orientation that is fixed in our mind. Yeah. In ectopic kidney, that orientation doesn't work. And therefore, you have to see the angle where exactly the angle is. Sometimes through the uh, flexible nephroscope, you have to put contrast and see where which way you have to uh, put the nephroscope, angulate the nephroscope and go into that particular uh, calyx. In, 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 uh, nowadays, uh, are you using first choice if a small volume stone is present as RIRS normally? 
because majority of the people say one attempt you can do if the ureter is normal and uh, if you can see the stone uh, and the PUJ is not obstruction is not there a little tilt towards the RIRS is there in a particularly pelvic ectopic in this. Yes, yes, definitely. In fact, uh, with the advent of uh, the flexible ureteroscope, smaller ureteroscope with the laser, in fact, our number of ectopic kidney PCNLs have gone down. Previously, we used to do a lot of ectopic kidney PCNLs, but more than half of those uh, cases which otherwise would have done PCNL now are amenable by RIRS. Yeah, so, yeah. RIRS definitely is safe. And because now we have, and at the most, even if it is two-stage RIRS, it doesn't matter for the patient. Sir. But if the stone is bigger one, say then, two centimeter or stagon or something like that, then uh, that is the those are the cases which are now for ectopic kidney PCNL. Otherwise, as you describe that one centimeter up to one point five centimeter, even if it is required two-stage uh, RIRS, it is worth it rather than venturing into the PCNL. Sir, in Arshu kidney, a lot of times in CT, PUJ obstruction, as you already mentioned, there is no need to worry, you can do it. Uh, in even uh, EQ ucal obstruction will be, there won't be any obstruction in PTPS scan. But if you do any such case and uh, did you ever face continuous leak from the, uh, even after putting uh, digestant or digestant removal, any, any chance if the leak is there after stone removal, not only in ectopic kidney, sir, mm -hmm. Hmm. In case, if borderline case, have you ever felt that leak is there and then you have to manage for a long time with stent? Yeah, so if if there is a borderline POJ-like thing where we are not certain, sometimes you are absolutely certain that there is no obstruction at all. The system is not dilated, peripheral colitis stones yes. and that. So that is not a problem. But if there is a little bit di dilemma, then we would always prefer to do put a uh, digestant in the beginning itself on the in the in the PCN rather than waiting for uh, things to heal and then uh, leakage and is that so it is better to once you clear up the stone better to put an integrate DJ and uh, finish the uh, procedure. Sir, is there any low role of laparoscopic pyelolithotomy because people say it is very easy in Arshu kidney especially if PUJ obstruction is present anyway that is an option. Any any comment on laparoscopy role in ectopic, uh, I mean, arch kidney? Laparoscopy role is there, definitely, especially but if, there is, a, if uh, there is a PUJ obstruction with multiple uh, secondary stones, definitely it is laparoscopic uh, pyeloplasty with pyelolithotomy. But uh, in a, in a uh, solitary uh, stone, uh, not dealing with uh, PUJ, there can be a role but it can be tricky. I mean, there are people who are used to laparoscopy and this, they can do it. But apart from laparoscopy, PCNL is quite easy in those cases. Yes, laparoscopy sir. is a difficult procedure. Yes, sir. PCNL becomes much simpler. The uh, common uh, worry in people's mind, especially the junior and I keep telling residents that horseshoe kidney PCNL is not, in fact, it is easier than the normal. Easier, easier, than, uh, easier than. So PCNL is quite easy as compared to uh, the laparoscopy. One more point, sir. When you go for inside and remove 80% of the stones, if 3-4 are there, you wanted to relook. Somehow these stones migrate to pelvis when you go back after 3-4 days or 12 days. Uh, what is that? I mean, you will see suddenly all of them back in the first surgery, you might have not searched well. Uh, yeah. Even if you have searched not the same, same, uh, same tract, if you go, you will find them in the pelvis ultimately. Now, there are multiple reasons for that. Because uh, the stones which are actually not accessible in the yeah. first stage become accessible in second stage without doing anything. Yeah. One, two, three factors. Because uh, during first stage, when you are doing uh, this, what happens is that you are pushing irrigation fluid is going in. And therefore, there is a pressure of the, um, fluid. the fluid which actually pushes you away from your vision, away from your nephroscope. And yeah. therefore, they keep going into the um, uh, different, different bizarre calices. When you, when you put a nephrostomy and allow the system to collapse, the tendency is to, uh, to uh, the stones for to fall with the gravity. And therefore, they fall into the pelvis again. And when you see next time, you see on fluoroscopy that stones actually are gather, gathered up at the, uh, at the tip of the nephrostomy. Secondly, sure. because the nephrostomy is draining continuously, there is a suction effect. Negative. There is a suction effect which is created 
and that uh, actually uh, sucks the kidney at the tip of the nephrostomy uh, tip yeah. and therefore uh, it becomes easy thirdly that uh, sometimes the uh, when you are actually doing the procedure intraoperatively and if you have done it for say uh, one hour or so the mucosal edema takes place Sir. you see in front of you that the mucosa becomes edematous and then uh, angulation and uh, this becomes difficult with uh, in a second stage after 48 hours that edema goes away and then you see that uh, the stones actually even if they don't fall it is very easily uh, accessible and your track gets mature so your angulation becomes very easy sir one more thing in arshu kidney when you used to uh, 30 french amplash now we are not using but yes. very large stone when you use uh, already entire sheath will be inside if you Correct. pay to 26 french nephroscope and try to move it looks very rigid. You, yeah. you, the moment uh, main part of the stone is over, by chance one stone it goes here, catching that stone becomes very difficult. But uh, uh, small nephroscope movement will be better, especially with ampla sheath. But yeah. for 30 by 26 uh, is really difficult to maneuver in our kidney with such a long length. Almost only one centimeter will be outside the skin. Correct. So, correct. Uh, what do you think? Better to go so, for mini cut only? Yeah, so better to go in a, in that situation. Suppose your whole of amplats has gone inside and you still are not able to um, uh, manage it, then better to go with the flexible nephroscope, flexible nephroscope. and then uh, clear up those stones. You, which type of flexible nephroscope you, I mean types, uh, which any, any uh, all all companies have you used in? Uh, yeah, we have the most, most of the uh, reusable nephroscope. Now there are digital nephroscopes. Yeah, now digital. They have become, which are 14 French size. Yes, sir. They were uh, fiber optic scopes. Then the dig digital uh, nephroscope, always 16 French size. Yes, Olympus sir. stars. And uh, now there are BioRad. Now there is a... Uh, uh, there are many uh, maneuverability is much better, sir. We have much, much we better. Have they are they are far because better. I have broken flexible nephroscope is keeping the tip inside the amplage and it has broken. Whereas right. now the 14 French biorad, I mean no conflicts of interest, but correct, they are correct, moving correct. from one calyx to other calyx easily. Correct, correct, correct. So that uh, newer scopes are thinner, they are sturdier, and uh, they have much more flexibility than the previous one. You you have published a paper uh, this ultrasound guided displacing the displacing the displacing the intestine. Yes. Uh, it is. I mean, if you see the picture, we believe in it because yeah. hardly any space will be there. Correct. Uh, that's the la la large paper. Uh, is there any is there any uh, any case of bowel injury by chance? I am asking you just. No bowel injuries. We had we have done lot of uh, pelvic ectopic kidneys. And uh, sometimes we have uh, bowel uh, fistulas which are there. You, you have but, seen at least one? Yes, yes. We have seen about two or three cases. Bowel, bowel injury? In a, in a large, uh, we have done, uh, especially those yeah. where... Your those paper is a big screen. That is one of the landmark paper. Yeah. Uh, so we have seen, but sometimes what happens is that the, uh, it, uh, the track, uh, like any other uh, thing, you allow the track to mature and then nothing happens. Even we have encountered bowel uh, injury even in normally placed kidney. And uh, once you identify it, allow the tract to mature and then uh, nothing happens. And uh, last question, sir. Uh, angioembolization in ectopic kidneys, if at all required, is it technically more difficult? Pelvic it, ectopic uh, it may be difficult. Uh, I have not uh, come across the case, but it may be difficult because pelvic ectopic usually kidney. in the pelvic ectopic, uh, the uh, the arteries are small. They come from common iliac or interiliac. Uh, I mean the uh, lower part of aorta, and yes. usually there are multiple. So angulating that, going into that artery, may become difficult. Difficult. So, yeah. in PCNL bleeding ectopic kidney may be difficult situation. This may be difficult situation. And even nephrectomy itself is a, I mean, by chance, if any youngster has to do nephrectomy, yeah. that also may be difficult, no, sir? May be difficult. It may be difficult. Nephrectomy is, uh, uh, if, if you have really big problem, and if you are not well versed with uh, this, then you may have to do open surgery. Open yeah. surgery also. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, majority of the cup kidneys, the calyces will be facing entirely posteriorly. In that yeah. case, uh, how will you do, sir? Through the pelvis only, we have to go. Cup kidney. Mm. 
in the, all the calluses are facing posteriorly towards it, the spine. Then it is better to do lap pyelolithotomy rather lap than PCNL. Because lap. even if you puncture, even if you do stage through, uh, through the pelvis, it is eventually going to be hazardous. Hazardous. So uh, PCNL through direct pelvic puncture is to be avoided. Avoid. If you have such large kidney completely pelvis dilated facing anteriorly, then lap pyelolithotomy is far more easier than doing all this jugglery. Okay. That's a nice discussion, sir. 230 people have watched the program. Thank you, sir. Nice. Very nice. Uh, stone, nice. usually everybody will be interested in that too, ectopic kidney. Yeah, correct, the feedback sir. I have taken is uh, they are taking this uh, for uh, nowadays people are listening the YouTube and writing the exam, MBBS students also. They are taking yeah. GNB and MCA students are taking this. Correct, correct, picture. correct. They read this topic and that is finished. The entire thing is covered in correct, this topic. Correct, correct. No, nice. that, is a, that is a big benefit that, um, and since you have covered large number of topics, various topics, you just visit and with whatever areas of this you want to revise it. Yes, you just sir. go understand that and then you can write a question. Write the, uh, Your whole uh, topic gets revised. Yes, yes sir. So but, that's a benefit. This topic uh, is very commonly asked question, I think, in DNB yeah, exams. Correct. So correct. it is very useful. Nicely covered, sir. Thank you very much once again.